Okay, so we are recording. So hello everyone. Welcome to our second CNC Switzerland meetup of this year. Uh, I will warmly welcome our speakers, um, Mark, Sayan, and Stepan. Say hello to everyone and everyone say hello to them. <laughs> Let's check our today's agenda. We will have a short welcome and intro, what I am doing right now. The first um, presentation will um, be hosted by Mark Merzinger. He will talk about the migration of Azure App Service to Azure Kubernetes Service. Second, we will have uh, the cloud native, cloud native Chaos Engineering with Litmus by Sian Mondal um, from Chaos Native. And at the end, uh, Dapper One Year of Production by Stepan. By Stepan. <laughs> Great. At the end, I will say some uh, final words. For me now, in uh, very important to remind you is that everything will be available on Vision TV. So make sure you will um, follow us on this channel uh, on YouTube. Uh, subscribe, of course, for any kind of updates that we will have. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box, so question and answer box. Uh, raise your hands if there are anything, if we will have some time after presentations. Uh, of course, we will give you the word. So just raise your hand so that I know that you would like to talk to some of the presentees. Um, Take notice, please, of our conference code of conduct that everyone received, uh, as I, uh, if I am not mistaken, by PDF. If anything goes wrong, uh, we will take care of that without any further um, notice. This will be the next edition, Thursday, October 21st, on the same time, Swiss time, uh, Central European time. And if you would like to present, we still have one slot for free. So um, just give me an email. I will give you my email and my contact details at the end of this meetup. So for now, this is all about me and the presentations. I would say, let's start. Mark, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Great. So I will start stop my sharing and give you the full power of the presentation. See you later, alligator. Thank you, Sergio. I will start to share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see it now. Great, I can see it, perfect. Great. Okay, so uh, yeah, welcome from my side as well. Um, I'm Mark and I will talk in this session about our uh, experience on migrating from uh, Azure App Service to Azure Kubernetes Service. Um, right, focus, ah, there it is. So who am I? Um, I'm Mark, I'm a software engineer at T&M. Uh, I'm part of the cloud engineering team and I'm most of the time involved around cloud projects on Azure and GCP. And although I'm a software engineer, I'm yeah, mainly involved on Azure uh, and let's say the cloud infrastructure from design to build and the automation part. And in my free time, I maintain my personal blog at cloudjourney.io. Uh, yeah, feel free to visit it and you can check it out under the QR code. Okay, so a few words about the agenda. Uh, I will give you a short introduction uh, of the application that we were running uh, on app service and how the app service environment uh, looked like. Um, I will show you the migration approach that we that we chose a few challenges that we faced the, during the migration, uh, pros and cons of the migration. And then uh, in the end, a few things that I would do differently the next time and a few things that I would keep in mind for the next time, or maybe you could keep in mind if you would have to do thing, some uh, this thing on your own. Okay, so um, here you can see the, the basic setup of our application on the, on the right hand side. So we have uh, multiple services, backend services that are based on ASP.NET Core 3.1. And we have a React based front end. So it's uh, yeah, front end API backend. Um, we are using domain driven design as the primary architectural flavor. 
Um, and for the biggest bounded context that I'm showing here right now, it's, um, it is using CQRS, so com command and query respons responsibility segregation and event sourcing patterns. So that's the reason why we have a command API and the query API and the projection handler uh, in the middle. Uh, you can see a software load balancer. So this is really an executable built by us, but it is more or less a, a router instead of a load balancer. But I will explain a little bit more about it uh, later. The front end itself, it's it's more or less yeah, delivered as, as JavaScript files. In the end, we have about five executables in this environment plus one that is running uh, initialization jobs. The environment that we used were, was initially based on uh, Azure App Services. Um, for those that don't know uh, what Azure App Service is, it's like a managed web server and a little bit more. So it's a pass service. Uh, you have an app service plan which hosts uh, a bunch of VMs and then you can run instances on top of it. So each of our uh, executables or front end was running as, as, as an instance on top of those uh, virtual machines. And you can see that we have a few of them. So our software load balancer was the main entry point and it was routing the requests to command query API. And yeah, the front end was just delivered to, to the clients. We had an Azure function in our compute layer that is uh, that is used for like initialization jobs and then regular cleanup jobs. Uh, all of our state is externalized. So we have a persistence layer based on Azure Cosmos DB and a few other ones. Um, so the compute part is completely, yeah, let's say stateless. Um, we have Azure Key Vault for our secret uh, management, so all the connection strings, all the secrets are stored in, in Azure Key Vault. And for the operations, we have the standard uh, Azure, Mic uh, Azure Monitor services. Um, we used a, a few different services as well, like Azure B2C, but they are not that important for this case. And um, so that was our, our, our starting position. And so why did we want to migrate away from, from this setup? So um, for those who know app services, those uh, instances are initially public. So everybody can access them. So like our, uh, let's say backend services, the command API or query API could be accessed from, from everywhere. And that's something that we didn't want to have. There are some approaches with app services to isolate it properly, um, but they are, well, well, they increase our infrastructure cost quite heavily. So you can increase the SKU and use an isolated plan, but it's quite quite expensive. And it would still be like the normal app service way. And um, if we want to grow with this application, uh, the, the complexity with, with um, the isolation mechanisms of app service would be quite, quite hard. And so um, it would make sense to go away from app service to Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, if we grow then with more more bounded contexts. And so um, we decided to, to, to use AKS in the future. And um, it, this was during development time. So we had no live migration in the end, but we still had to migrate our application to, uh, to AKS and uh, everything was automated until then. So um, we had like the infrastructure was automated with uh, resource manager templates and the deployment was done also with uh, Azure DevOps. And so we said, okay, we need to extend our Azure Resource Manager templates uh, to add the AKS resources so we can run both environments in parallel. Um, we had to create Docker files, Helm charts. Um, we said we will use Visual Studio to yeah, distribute our application to the environments. And we will do that by extending our existing CI CD pipelines with uh, Azure De DevOps. Uh, one challenge in this uh, yeah, migration approach was that we have to to keep uh, the team constant to create concentrate on features because they had to deliver a lot of features, and we didn't want to um, yeah slow them down. So um, it was me doing the design and the heavy lifting, and then I, I took two of the team and and the, and the architect to keep them informed and to take them into the boat uh, how I did things. And you will later see another slide in um, how, how we did the knowledge transfer so that they can then maintain the system. 
So um, with that, we we started to, to do the initial design. So uh, everything that was previously app services was was replaced with AKS. So AKS just is yeah more or less the vanilla uh, Kubernetes service managed by by Microsoft. Um, and then, as you probably know, Kubernetes itself it's quite empty in the beginning. So we had to make some decisions of what services we use to yeah to have basic functionality inside our cluster. So first of all, we we used uh, Nginx as our ingress controller that will be exposed to, to the internet. Um, Kuber, uh, AKS uh, installs security patches on on our worker nodes automatically, but uh, the restart is something that we have to do, and so we are using QRD for it. Um, of course, uh, we need TLS for our applications, so uh, we decided to use Cert Manager to, to automate this process with uh, Let's Encrypt, and the remainder of our environment could stay the same. So we kept all the persistent services, all uh, Azure Monitor and Secret Management services, and the only service that we added uh, was uh, a virtual network from Azure where our uh, nodes will run inside and that we can use to isolate our uh, persistent services too. So that, for example, calls to Cosmos to be are only possible from inside this virtual network. And that was the, the plan that we had to, to from the environment to build. And so we, we, we started to do that. And the first step was yeah, to extend our resource manager templates. Um, as I said, we already had everything automated and we just added more templates to, to contain the AKS resources. This was yeah, rather easy because uh, we already had it there more or less and just adding AKS functionality. But then we had to extend this pipeline uh, yeah, in, in, a, in a good degree because we needed all the basic cluster functionality like ingress and QRD, cert manager. This picture is just simplified because there are a lot of steps involved in, in having everything ready that you need to run your application. And so after we, we finished this, we had uh, Kubernetes ready and then we had to take care about uh, the application. The first step that we did was to uh, containerize all the executables. Um, as I said, we were using uh, Visual Studio as our uh, development environment, and it provides a feature to auto-generate Docker files, which is quite convenient. You can, uh, it, it considers the required .NET Core version. It creates a multi-stage Docker file, so you have a build and a release stage inside of it. Uh, the, the project references are uh, correct. And so you're ready to go, at least for the first sign, because um, if you take a deeper look, you can see that it uses faster slim images for the release stage, and they contain many vulnerabilities. And it's something we, we had to solve for our environment because it's, yeah, we, we cannot release an application with like already containing three critical uh, vulnerabilities inside the base image. And and an issue that we run into was the references of the other projects were static in this, this Docker file. So each time we change references under our projects, we would have to regenerate the Docker file. And so we said, okay, we will use it as uh, the initial generation for this Docker file, and then we will adapt it to uh, our needs and removing those hard coded uh, project references. And after that step, we had our executables containerized and then we had to generate uh, the helm charts that we can distribute uh, the application or install it on, on our clusters so we used visual studio for this task as well because it provides the same auto generation feature as for, for the docker file um, i believe it does basically a helm in it because it creates all the the deployment ingress service and so on uh, yaml files for you and with it with the default values file just like a helm in it um, it's good because it's again convenient and you can just then use it to to build up the remainder of, of your environment but as soon as you take a deeper look at security again it is uh, pretty weak in in its default settings so there are no rootless, no read-only, rootfs, um, 
no job capabilities. So all the interesting stuff that you can do uh, on a Kubernetes cluster is it's it's, it's not pre-configured on those charts. And um, to automate this, we used uh, Chekhov. I will show it show it later, um, so that we can have each time we check in the new version an automated report of um, yeah of the best practices or if you're violating a policy. And we had to add, for example, then additionally the, the horizontal pod auto scaler because all of our services are stateless and they can scale horizontally without any issue. And this was not well generated, and so we had to do that uh, on our own. So with those two um, steps, we had everything to build our uh, CI pipeline. So uh, we used a single Git repo approach for the backend. The frontend was in a dedicated repo and the infrastructure a dedicated repo. Um, we have then dedicated pipelines for frontend and backend and infrastructure. But uh, I will just show the, the backend um, pipelines and repo. So again, we had one, one central Git repo for the backend. We were using the standard Git, Git flow and pull request validation triggers for our pipelines. And we had then two pipelines that are, were triggered uh, during push or PR. Uh, the container pipeline, it, it's also simplified, was just uh, running the, the Docker build. Um, we all, we're also running the, the .NET Core tests inside our Docker file and then publishing them as, um, as test, test results of our pipeline. And then as a final step, before we put, publish it to our Azure Container Registry, we will use or we used Trivi to scan the image. And so we have a hard cut there. So if there is some something critical or high vulnerability in our image or even medium, um, we will stop our pipeline there because we don't want to, to even push it into our registry, um, but we will continuously monitor our, our registry with uh, Azure Defender in, in production, but that's a different topic. Um, for the charts, again, we were using Chekhov, then it's basically a, a Helm package and publish. Um, both scanning solutions that we were using um, have the nice option to export it as JUnit XMLs. And so we can push it to Azure DevOps and then see the test results as part of our pipeline run, which is quite convenient without going into logs or, or, or something like that from the build agent. Then, um, yeah, after we, we had the CI setup uh, finished, uh, we went on to build the continuous delivery pipelines. So they were based on Azure DevOps as well. Um, the, the container CI and the chart CI both were like triggering a deployment on the dev stage. This was completely um, without manual intervention, intervention. So each time a new commit was built from development or master, it uh, will directly be yeah, deployed to the development stage. And this is yeah, more or less simple, just running a few Helm upgrade commands for each of our executable um, that we want to deploy to, to the environment. Uh, we have currently three environments, dev, test, and production. Um, yeah, we, were, we are deploying the backend as one. So we are not deploying each executable independent because it's a bounded context. So most of the time, the changes yeah, should be deployed together because they are uh, dependent on each other. And um, yeah, that's the reason why we deploy them as once. Um, we were using, for example, the wait flag to check if our deployment was successful. This is not working all the time because sometimes if you're triggering a release and then you're short on resources, the cluster needs to scale and you run into a timeout. Yeah, the wait flag doesn't help there. <laughs> um, as I previously said, the basic cluster components like uh, Nginx and so on were part of the infrastructure pipeline and not part of the, the application release. And with those steps, um, we managed to completely containerize our application, package it as Helm charts, and then push it on our uh, Kubernetes cluster. And um, as I said, we had to keep up uh, uh, 
the flow of, of building features in the team. And so initially the team had like six members, one PO, a scrum master and four developers. And I was involved in the team for around four weeks to, uh, to do the migration uh, in part time. Um, I did, well, let's say the heavy lifting uh, to, to build the design and the automation and to have everything yeah, yeah, ready to, to build on. And then, as, as I said, I had regular uh, meetings with the, the architect and the two colleagues that were mainly maintaining those pipelines. And so that they know what I do, we, we left over some tasks. For example, the, the jobs that we had uh, running previously on uh, Azure Functions, that was a task for them to also containerize, build the helm, helm chart, adapt the CI CD, and so they could gain the knowledge that they needed to continuously maintain um, this pipeline or the whole environment. And then in, after those four weeks, I, I left the team, but I was still in standby um, to, to discuss with them possible issues or other enhancements. And since then we had like roughly once a month, uh, a meeting to discuss uh, new features or challenges that they had to solve. Okay, uh, now a few challenges that, that, <laughs> that we faced during uh, the migration. So uh, as I explained, App Services Plan is like a, a bunch of VMs and you, you can run your application without much overhead on top of them. So we were running all those uh, instances like command query API all on the same uh, virtual machines. And it was uh, quite, yeah, quite cheap in, 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 in this view. And as soon as we moved to AKS, we introduced like an overhead uh, because all of our environments are completely separated. So we have like three clusters, one per environment. And with AKS per default, you, you have one node pool um, that hosts DNS, the log agents and all the stuff that it, Kubernetes, the Azure Kubernetes service needs to run. And um, so they need CPU and memory. And then um, we had to add our components, QRD, Cert Manager, Nginx, uh, to, to be able to expose up our application. And so we needed even more uh, compute resources. And during that time, we had the challenge to keep the cost as low as possible for development and test stages. And the solution was, uh, well, it was not beautiful, but it still worked. We, had, we, we really lowered our resource requests for those environments and for our applications. And we, we, we disabled the horizontal pod autoscaler. And so we could limit the cluster autoscaler as well to two nodes maximum. And we could keep the cost on a, on a low level. Um, we lost a little bit of the performance in this time, but it wasn't that important because it was just development and in integration environment. Um, but uh, yeah, it it still solved our problem uh, in in this time. And after that, we could uh, well, increase everything back to the to the normal um, requests and limits that we that we needed to run our application. The next challenge that we faced, uh, I already mentioned it, was base image vulnerabilities. Um, the buster limit image is really contains a lot of vulnerabilities, and so we know that um, Microsoft provides for ASP.NET Core a an, an Alpine image, and it was the easiest solution to switch to Alpine because it's it's very small and it really had zero vulnerabilities. And so we used it. Uh, it was quite simple to change it in the Docker file, but we directly broke our, our application uh, because obviously <laughs> Alpine images don't contain any of uh, the cultures that we needed. It was one of our dependencies using a culture. And well, to solve this, this problem, it was quite easy. We just had to install the cultures as part of our um, yeah, Docker file. Uh, there's a quite good uh, blog post from Andrew Locke. I referenced it on this slide. If you face this problem as well, uh, you can read this blog, it's, it's quite good. And yeah, with this challenge, we could, well, after solving this challenge, we had a really small image with our applications and uh, low to almost none vulnerabilities. So um, 
the last challenge that I want to talk about, um, it was a rather small challenge, was the read-only root FS. So because it was a, a new application and we know we didn't do anything like writing to the file system, we thought, okay, shouldn't be an issue to enable uh, read-only root FS. And we did it. It was no issue. We could deploy our application. It was running as soon as we uh, <laughs> uploaded a file. Uh, we could see in the log state we had tons of uh, five, uh, HTTP 500. And then we figured out that one of the .NET Core uh, libraries was using the slash temp directory to buffer uh, large file uploads. And so we had to introduce ephemeral volumes for the temp directory, and we were not using in memory, but uh, disk as the ephemeral volume, just because of the, the limited memory that we have on our nodes uh, right now. And um, large file uploads are not that, that common. So uh, I think it's the best hybrid solution. Okay, so those were all of the challenges that we, the, that I, not all of the, them that, it, that we faced, but at least the one that I presented right now. Uh, a few pros and cons about the migration. So overall, the, the migration was a success. As I said, we have three environments running. Um, I have the same amount of pros and cons, although I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons. I want to yeah, talk about the cons because there are some. Um, but I first I will start with the pros. So um, we gained a lot of flexibility for our application. So we can do all the isolation stuff that we need to. We can do it really in a fine grained way with network policies and we can tune everything that, that we need in the way that we need. Um, we can insource um, stuff that we did uh, extra uh, into the cluster. So for example, the jobs that we run as Azure Functions, we can now solve them with one API and everything is Helm and container. It's, it's easier to, to, to apply to other problems. And as well, we, we can grow consistently now. So with the second bounded context, it works exactly in the same way. And it's, it's not adding any complexity to our setup. Uh, the cons, it's, um, yeah, almost everything is do it your own. It's definitely like this. So Kubernetes, uh, our AKS is, is empty in its uh, yeah, initial deployment. And so you have to do everything on your own. You have to select the ingress control will take care of TLS. That's nothing you have to do with a path service. Um, we added responsibility to, to us. So we need to maintain a certain level of knowledge uh, to maintain those environments and to keep up with the tools that we use. And the, the biggest con was the low support of, 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 I, of our IDE. So we were developing with Visual Studio and uh, for the, the bounded context with CQRS and event sourcing, we were using a multi startup uh, project. So we were running four, three or four executables at the same time because we had to test if something goes into a command that it yeah, works throughout the whole system. And you can debug multiple containers in Visual Studio, but to do that in a good way you need Docker Compose. So would, we would have to maintain additionally Docker Compose files that we didn't want to do. And there is no real support for debugging multiple um, executables in a Kubernetes cluster. You can just debug always one inside your cluster. And that's yeah not really close to the, to the way that we deployed our application. And so we said, okay, we will keep our current IDE setup and um, and start with all the container stuff with our uh, CI pipeline. Okay, uh, yeah, the things I would do differently the next time. Um, the first one is probably a no brainer, but I can definitely can recommend it to everybody. Do the security related stuff directly in the beginning of your project or as early as possible, because uh, it saves you a lot, a, lot, a lot of time. You will, definitely figure out stuff about your application that you didn't thought it will do. For example, that the read only root FS, we didn't know that .NET was using this, um, the temp folder for, to, to buffer uh, file uploads, for example. And if you can solve this early in the project, um, you have a better awareness of your, um, yeah, 
of your application and, and what it really does in the end. And of course, you avoid issues in, in, in the future. Um, the second thing I would do differently is probably map a bounded context to a single Helm chart, because right now we are deploying each of the executables with a single uh, or each one with its own Helm chart. Um, for our requirements, it would make sense to, to move it into one single Helm chart because they are deployed together at the bounded context. It would simplify our CI CD setup quite, quite heavily because we don't have to do like four steps all the time, just one step for, for the backend uh, bounded context. And we could centralize like network policies. Right now we're deploying it with the first Helm chart, which is, yeah, it solves the problem, but it's not really fancy. And uh, so, yeah, it would make sense to, to move them to one. Well, as an other option, we could use Helm file, but we didn't, didn't do that in, in, in this project. The other two, um, yeah, topics I would do differently is like uh, splitting the Git repos. So I would now always maintain a um, chart repo and a application source code repo just to avoid um, pipeline issues, for example, for the triggers. And then you have to add excludes if everything is in the same repo. Uh, it, it makes the li your life simpler having two repositories. And then uh, as well, I would split the, the cluster or the infrastructure pipeline into really deploying infrastructure as code and deploying the basic cluster components. Because again, you don't always change something in your infrastructure because you just want to, I don't know, upgrade Nginx and now we would have to run the infrastructure the infrastructure's code pipeline as a whole, although we are not changing anything in the infrastructure just from Nginx. Okay, uh, yeah, things to keep in mind for, for the next time, or maybe you could keep in mind if you have to do it. Um, if you're migrating from a path service like Azure App Service to uh, Kubernetes, keep in mind that you get a lot more responsibility and you have to do a lot more. So for, a, for App Service, you don't have to care about upgrades. You're just taking care of your application. Um, now with AKS, we have to take care of the whole cluster. We have to take care of the audit logs. We have to monitor this whole cluster. Um, we have to take care of the, all the networking tasks. Okay, that's something that we needed, but of course, it's something you have to do. And especially for, for operations, then um, you have to update all those dependencies. So all the components that you install in your cluster, you have to keep them up to date. And especially with fast moving Kubernetes APIs, uh, you have to definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, the second topic um, is that, yeah, investing a little bit more into the knowledge of the team would make sense because initially uh, we didn't thought about just moving like the Azure function into Kubernetes. Um, it was more or less than, uh, yeah, during the migration figured out, hey, it's just running basic jobs. We can solve that with, with Kubernetes. And so maybe we could solve even more stuff with the same concepts there that we are already reusing, but it requires knowledge to do that. And yeah, the, the next topic is uh, automate as much as possible. So we automated everything. So it was really easy during development to kill a cluster and then just redeploy the whole environment. It really simplified. Uh, our work, and I, I can really recommend it to everybody to keep a really high degree of automation in your environment because that's the way to keep everything consistent and reproducible uh, yeah, for your environments. And last but not least, uh, don't forget to try out new tools. So the, the few tools that I mentioned, uh, we used even more. So for example, we, we used uh, Coop Hunter or Coop Bench. Uh, Popeye and Kryptonize to, to check how our security posture is of the cluster. So we used the open source versions there. And for example, for AKS, there's the AKS checklist. It's a quite handy checklist for all the security measurements that you can use in your cluster to yeah, lower attack, attack surface, to have best practices for disaster recovery and so on. So definitely uh, yeah, watch out for such tools and then use them in yeah in your environment or 
uh, migration. Okay, so that was everything from the technical side uh, in this talk. So uh, if you're interested in projects like the one that I presented, or if you're interested in TNM, uh, yeah, feel free to check out our website. It's ti8m.com, or you can ask me as well. And uh, that's now everything from my side. And I think we have a few minutes left for questions. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so feel free uh, due, to, due to the fact that we have still eight minutes for some questions. If anyone would like to speak out, just raise your hands and I will give you the permit to talk directly to Mark. Mark, if, feel free to share your links uh, of the presentation and of the homepage, of course, web page um, on the chat if you like to, uh, so that everyone can just copy paste it. So, I would say the board is yours, attendees. If you have any question, I will wait a few seconds. If nothing, or oh, no one will speak up, we will go further with Zion. So no one is typing, no one is raising their hand. I guess Mark, you had, ah, yes, no. Yeah. Mark. <laughs> sorry, it was, I, I wanted to write it to the, to yeah. the attendees. <laughs> I have yeah. to reset it, sorry. You can just uh, switch panelists and attendees and then everyone can get it. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Great. So, super. So no one is picking up. Uh, I would say uh, your presentation will, was quite clear then. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, again. Uh, then Thank we you too. switch to Scion with Cloud Native Chaos Engineering with Litmus. Feel free to right. share your screen, Scion. Uh, let's see if everything works. Yeah, I have shared it. Can you see it? Great. Yes, I can see it. Everything is clear. Awesome. So happy talk. Thank you. All right, uh, so it's uh, first of all, it's great to be here. And uh, I'm Shine. My talk today is about uh, cloud native chaos engineering. And uh, this is con going to focus on how you can actually implement, how you can actually induce chaos on hybrid clouds. So, a little bit about myself I am a software engineer at Chaos Native and also the contributor, a co team member at Litmus. So, Litmus is the CNCF sandbox project, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And this is the tool actually which I work on. So the agenda for today is um, I'll talk about what is chaos engineering, which is pretty evident, but I'll just talk about uh, how the traditional method uh, used to work. Uh, why do we need this and what are the problems that are there currently uh, with the normal uh, traditional chaos engineering workflow that we do? Uh, where does the cloud native chaos engineering part of it comes into the picture and the different tools that are currently in the market? And uh, then we're going to shift to Litmus and how Litmus can actually solve those problems that I mentioned and the tools out there, what are their disadvantages and so. And also we are at towards the end, we're going to see how uh, this all fits into the picture with uh, a live demo. So to start right off, what is chaos engineering? Well, it's uh, it's the practice of breaking things in production is the common um, you know, the sentence that we hear quite a lot when we hear about chaos engineering. But uh, it's it's not just production. It can be done uh, either pre-production. It can be done on on staging cluster. It can be done on production itself too. And it's not just uh, something that the ops team only handles. It can, you know, the traditional approach focuses more on the ops side. But I I'd say uh, with the chaos cloud native chaos engineering side of things, we are shifting to a developer side as well. So either developer or SREs or the ops team, anyone can do it. So this was specifically targeted when we tried to build it. Must we targeted it specifically for SREs? But now it's shifted, and you can consider it more as a framework than a tool uh, toolkit currently. So um, why? Chaos engineering is necessary. Well, um, as you all know, downtimes are really expensive and we would want to avoid it at all costs. Uh, so uh, let's say we do a lot of testing in our applications whenever we, want, whenever we put, it, put it up. So uh, how it differs is it's very different from a regular smoke test or E2E test or load test, uh, right? So we do these sort of a test in production. So what happens when there's a certain network loss? What happens when, we, when, there's, a, when there's a CPU hog in your, in your system? So those things we 
cannot manage by simple E2E tests or smoke tests. So we need something like a chaos engineering, a chaos test in this type of scenario to see how, what would happen if you break things uh, intentionally in production. Now, um, a feedback loop can be activated when we do this sort of a testing and chaos engineering focuses mostly on the right side of the DevOps to uh, uh, the DevOps loop rather than the left. So we should test it and we should not wait before, uh, you know, we shouldn't wait uh, to test the right side of the loop. Now the standard practice do exist, like I mentioned, and uh, it doesn't cover a lot of the large deployments or what happens when you have a high availability environment. So those type of scenarios we do need to consider when we are talking about uh, resilience and uh, we do not want to burn our hands when we already have a safety measure. So it's uh, better safe than sorry, sort of a situation. So how it's typically done, uh, chaos engineering is done typically in, in by organizing game days. So game days are like, uh, you can call, you can think of it like a fire drill where uh, people sort of uh, plan intentionally to break things and there's a team who is doing it. So it's like a safe environment to break things and see how things are working, how resiliency, how resilience uh, plays uh, an important part in, in your application. Also, uh, uh, the these sort of a chaos uh, the chaos injection isn't being targeted in a ci cd environment as of now we do not see a lot of solutions doing it and uh, like i mentioned it was only the sres that we targeted but then uh, developers are someone developers are sort of a persona that we didn't really uh, considering to the picture which we have now but uh, in in the long run developers are not someone that uh, we consider like generally people consider as uh, them doing chaos engineering since it's mostly the ops team that handle these type of things. And uh, it requires manual planning and execution, uh, generally speaking, as well as uh, chaos observability is not a inbuilt part of it, wasn't in the traditional system. So um, also there's custom measures for management and seeing any results. So let's say there's, uh, you have done a lot of chaos engineering, but there's no set way of knowing the results until you do it manually or you execute those, you take those resources and you do some sort of analytical solution on top of it to see. So there's no custom built uh, built in solution that you get uh, to the market. Now, this is the, um, the market right now. So uh, we believe that uh, Kubernetes has already crossed the mainstream market. And this is like people have already uh, adopted uh, Kubernetes, so it's moving uh, on top of the uh, the mainstream market. Whereas cloud native, on the other hand, is uh, sort of the chaos engineering in the cloud native side is, uh, is still in early adoption. But whereas the cloud native way that Kubernetes provides has been uh, taken up majorly in the market. So that is what we uh, focus on to do the cloud native sort of a chaos engineering because reliability, as we see, is a budding challenge in in containers as we as we see in this particular chart. Now, uh, why do Kubernetes, uh, why Kubernetes needs a resilient toolkit? Well, uh, we do a lot of development. We also push it to production. We want to check uh, both sides of it. We want to check whether an application works perfectly in development. We want to check whether it works perfectly on production. It's not just like we do a certain type of tests and leave it there. We want to test both sides of it. Now, uh, the driving factors that are majorly, uh, we look forward, Two is uh, the SLOs for our continuous delivery. We want to do chaos in particular platforms, and we also want a continuous validation sort of a scenario where whatever we do, we want a continuous validation that yes, you did something, you injected this particular chaos, and your application is still working. So you you have a pretty good uh, microservice uh, which is working right there. Now the tradition, so, uh, traditional sort of chaos engineering tools. Uh, which uh, do not uh, are not really tethered to the Kubernetes side of things, and uh, they are not really cloud native. So that was the uh, problem that was there. Now, if we move on to the uh, cloud native side of it, there are these uh, five principles that um, we consider uh, to be the key factors. Which is, uh, it should your your application should be open source in, or, in order for community collaboration as well, and your individual APIs or uh, the lifecycle management that you do should be open. So that uh, let's say us particular user A wants to use some part of your application, they can just target your particular API and be able to do th something with it. So it should be open when it comes to cloud native. And also it should have an open observability. So you shouldn't be tethered to some sort of a uh, monitoring setup. You can uh, integrate any sort of monitoring in your system. So it should be open when it comes to observability. And GitOps is uh, a really bumming topic right now. So it, if, if you have GitOps, you can definitely uh, measure the, like you can do a version versioning of whatever uh, events that's happening and you can check 
who triggered what event and what is happening in your development life cycle. So yeah, GitOps is something that we also consider to be a part of the uh, cloud native uh, principle. Now, what are the benefits of having a cloud native uh, application? It's you can run services without any outage when you do a chaos engineering in cloud native uh, environment. You can run the services to meet the SLOs and SLOs, and you can also upgrade your service without any outage. So you can see whether there's an outage or not pre, uh, before the actual thing actually happens. And you can, of course, scale your services on demand. So you can do it without any tension. So that's that's that. So the different tools that are out there in the market that are doing it uh, the cloud native way are one is Chaos Blade, which is uh, by Alibaba, and they have like it's a it's a great application which uh, you you can do fault injections for Java, C plus plus Node, and they have uh, multiple ways of managing different experiments. But also at the same time, it, they, they uh, the most most of the part of the documentation is in Chinese, and it's sort of a language barrier when it comes to uh, global readability, and also it lacks scheduling or uh, safety reporting. So how your application, how safe is your application and the general reporting when it comes to that. Now there's also Chaos Mesh, which has, which has a beautiful web UI and you can control, uh, you can you can manage different experiments through it. And it also has support for CICD, but uh, the dashboard isn't very secure when it comes to the security aspects of things. And ad hoc experiments can sometimes run indefinitely. So that, that's a con side of it. And then there's Chaos Toolkit as well, which uh, gives you pretty good control over your experiment. So it has very extensible uh, experiments and it has built-in login and coding too, but there's no native scheduling to it. So you have to do it manually and also it has limited portability. So it's not really very portable and there is no easy way to run these, these uh, attacks. They do have very good attacks, but there's no easy way of running them in multiple places. So that's the problem currently that's uh, the chaos uh, cloud native side is facing. So the tool that I'm going to talk about is called Litmus and it's an, it's an open source uh, uh, CNCF sandbox project, which is, uh, which was uh, made uh, as, a, as a toolkit, which currently you can call it as a framework because it has all these features that you see. It has open, AP, uh, open API and lifecycle management, community collaboration. It is, of course, open source. And also it comes up with uh, like inbuilt with open observability with uh, Prometheus and Grafana uh, inbuilt to it. And it also has GitHub support. So whatever uh, chaos engineering you do on top of it would be uh, activated if you like turn the GitOps feature on. And you can just uh, see all the events that are happening in your particular Git repository. So it will work as uh, Git as DB, sort of. So yeah, that's it. and. Uh, Litmus would generally uh, help you run things in your Kubernetes cluster, whether it's your cluster or any other cluster. So you can have a very cluster wide scope when it comes to that. Now, uh, I already talked about what is Litmus. Now, what are the components that are there? So you get a health chart. You can, of course, uh, install it through a direct manifest. You can do two types of installs. One is cluster scope and another is namespace scope. So what happens with the cluster scope is, let's say uh, a person A has a cluster and uh, they want to share you you install litmus on the cluster a and there's another cluster b which is also yours and you want to do chaos on that cluster b so you can connect your cluster b to the cluster a and then you can run chaos on the cluster b while you are still in cluster a so you get a cluster wide support uh, with that and you can connect multiple clusters it's not just limited to a and b you can go up to z and more and then there's another thing called namespace scope. So uh, what happens is in a lot of scenarios, uh, companies do give out one cluster and you are sort of uh, uh, like assigned a certain namespace in the cluster. So you can install Litmus in that particular namespace too. So whatever uh, injection you do, the chaos, the resources and the application has to be in the specific namespace where you install Litmus. So these are the two types of installations that we support. And also uh, there's something called as a chaos hub, which we call it as the hub of experiments, chaos experiments that we have. And uh, we have currently 30 plus experiments and they are very extensive and declarative. So you can of course, um, either uh, use that as a, as a template or you can create your own. Uh, we use Argo CD behind the hood. So you have to wrap everything in an Argo workflow and things should work fine. So there are two options, a public and a private chaos hub. And this is where I'll just stop it for one moment and show this to you. So this is my demo chart. And also I have the portal up and running here. So if I go to chaos hub, I, you should be able to see two things. So this is the default one that I just mentioned, the chaos hub that comes in built. So if I go to hub.chaos, it must chaos. This is where um, this is the uh, hub that I was talking about. 
and it has a list of all these different experiments that we have, which uh, considers both uh, bare metal experiments, uh, cloud experiments, like uh, not just Kubernetes specific experiments. So you have, uh, you can uh, specifically target Cassandra or CodeDNS or Kafka or VMware or any of these experiments. So you have uh, a lot of them. And uh, this is the chaos hub that comes inbuilt with Litmus. So this is the default one you will have when you install Litmus. And this is my private hub. So if your enterprise requirement needs a certain chart that you want to keep, you can do this. Like I have a private repository called demo charts and I have all these charts here, which is I basically put one code DNS and a lot of generic experiments to it, like uh, node power off, node restart, node taint and pod, uh, pod delete and those things. So this, this is my individual experiment list. If you want, you can keep your own private uh, experiments uh, that are specific to your requirements, and then you can just import it to Litmus. So in this private hub, I have all these experiments that are in my Git repo. So if I make any change here, uh, it should be reflected to the portal itself. So yeah, I just wanted to point it out real quick. That's going back to my presentation. Uh, so you have a public chaos hub and a private chaos hub. And, uh, so uh, those two things you can, of course, integrate to the portal, like I just showed you, and you can run these experiments either on prem or cloud and uh, on a VM or bare metal, and it's entirely wrapped in Argo CD or Flux CD. So whatever uh, experiments, whatever workflows you do would have to be an Argo workflow. Currently, that's what we support, and that should trigger your uh, chaos experiments. Now, um, to actually understand how we do the chaos experiment, we need to go through this uh, very quickly. It's, uh, it's the three important CRDs that we use. Uh, one, of, one, uh, one is chaos experiment, next is chaos engine, and the third is chaos result. So these are the three ones that are very important. Now, I already showed you the hub. What a chaos experiment does is it uh, pulls the particular experiment that you choose. So let's say you choose a pod delete. So chaos experiment would pull the pod delete in your uh, particular uh, cluster but it won't install it or do anything uh, to it. It will just pull it and keep it there. And chaos experiment is exactly the um, metadata that your experiment has. So let's say it, your experiment has a certain label. It has a certain spec. So everything will be there in the chaos experiment CRD. Uh, chaos engine is actually what binds your application instance to the experiment. So you want to run uh, pod delete on Nginx. The chaos engine would actually bind the pod delete experiment to your Nginx container. So it keeps a track of that. And then comes the chaos result, which when your chaos injection finishes and uh, whatever is the result of that would be shown in the chaos results here. So one important or uh, what we consider as the heart of this diagram is the chaos operator. Now chaos operator is the most important one here, but it's uh, it's sort of a, uh, a man in the background doing all this uh, mix and match. So what it does is actually Take, uh, like uh, listens to the chaos engine continuously. And when when we, when I talk about binding the application instance, uh, chaos engine actually binds it, but chaos operator is the one which uh, tries to find that if the application, the target application, the target cluster, let's say Nginx, if Nginx is present in whichever cluster you want to do uh, chaos on. So let's say you, you just randomly select uh, cluster B, I want to do Nginx uh, pod delete on cluster B. So chaos operator will be the one which will find that oh, you do not have a cluster B. So you cannot uh, induce chaos there, or you do not. You have a cluster B, but you do not have any Nginx deployment there, so you cannot do this. So chaos operator is the one which uh, does this, and it also validates the different run properties as well. So let's say the policies that you put forward and the uh, in chaos interval and those things. Now chaos engine is also something where you do most of the tunables, so you can change the total chaos duration, you can change the chaos inter uh, the chaos uh, interval time and all those things. So you can uh, basically tune a lot of these things that chaos experiment provides to you by default. And chaos operator is also responsible for spinning up chaos runners and chaos runners are the one who actually spin up this multiple chaos jobs. So let's say you run pod delete. So chaos runner would be the main um, CR which will run multiple pod delete jobs and kill the Nginx container multiple times. So this is uh, that in, in brief. Now, if you move forward, this is the litmus uh, architecture that I just talked about. So we have the chaos agent, the chaos operator, and the different metrics which we use for Prometheus. This is the open observability that I just talked about. And we have uh, chaos interleaved analytics. So if you trigger a certain chaos, that should show up in your uh, analytics uh, live. So it should be like a, a thing that watches, keeps a watch continuously if you have your monitoring set up. Now, uh, to move forward, we have these uh, different sort of experiments, which I already showed you using the chaos hub. And you can do uh, chaos in CI pipelines too. 
So um, let's say you want to target a particular um, application in your CI when when you when you're doing CI, you can choose any of these op uh, like options. You can do using GitLab. You can use GitHub Actions, Spinnaker, or Captain. And um, you it, basically there's a chaos stage in the middle. So there's application A and application B, and you do this uh, GitHub action in the middle. Let's say a, a, we call it a chaos stage, and uh, this is where it'll do all the uh, extra work in the background and uh, induce chaos for you. So you just need to put in the Name of the chaos experiment that you want. So um, for non-Kubernetes uh, chaos, we have this network access control API. So you can target this particular API, and uh, this would uh, trigger uh, chaos in, let's say, AWS or GK or uh, Azure or VMware. So we have all these different experiments. The only thing you need to do is uh, you just need to provide a config map, a secret of your uh, uh, the IAM role, basically, so that uh, the particular IAM role needed for each individual experiment so it can access your particular cluster and that's it so we can we now would be seeing this particular uh, the chaos experiments in action so i just uh, put it to the side and just show you one quick thing just close this one so i have my portal running i you can see there's two agents that are uh, that are there so if i go to agents quickly i have one mini cube agent that is running in my local system and then there's the self agent so the self agent is nothing but an uh, but a cluster that is running on aks and uh, i have both of them running right here so the reason i wanted to show you this is currently my context is set to mini cube so if i do a cube ctl um, get context then you should be able to see uh, I have a mini cube running and the cluster one is actually the AKS that is running. So the uh, Litmus is installed on cluster one. So that is why it's called as a self agent. By default, whenever you install Litmus, it installs a self agent for you where you can induce chaos. And also you can connect external agents. So this is why I wanted to do this external agent connectivity. So I have connected one mini cube externally. And uh, currently this is my uh, context. So I am running this uh, in the agent namespace. So what it does is it installs certain service accounts in your uh, namespace so that you can do uh, like these are the basic uh, CRs that are needed for Litmus to induce chaos. These are the chaos uh, CRs, you can call it that. So let's say I, I, I deploy something and I want to, I have my application running here and I want to induce some sort of a chaos experiment. I would need these in my, uh, in my external agent for the chaos to trigger. So these are the requirements that get installed by default when you connect a new agent. So you can do this sort of a connection using a tool called Litmus CTL. This is a binary that we have, and you just need to install this binary and uh, you can just do a Litmus CTL uh, agent connect. And you, it'll, uh, it's an interactive CLI, so it'll ask you things like uh, what is the uh, URL and uh, what do you want to name it, which namespace you want to save it to, and those things. So I have saved it to the agent namespace. If I do a kubectl um, get the namespaces, I should be able to see I have agent and there's no litmus or any namespace uh, connected to it. So that is the only reason I wanted to keep this and show this. And uh, if I go back and change my context to uh, the AKS, cluster so let me just do that real quick now if i do a not watch let me just do a cube secure get watch or let me just do a get namespaces so since this is the place where litmus is installed you can see uh, i created the litmus uh, i installed it in the litmus namespace so this is already there and then i have another namespace called demo which is where an nginx container is running so if i uh, just expand and see the pods in the litmus namespace I should be able to see almost similar pods that are there in the external agent, but here you see something else. You see the Litmus portal front end service, uh, the server service, and the Mongo service, the database where we store all these different uh, chaos results. So, uh, apart from that, uh, we have most of the things that are, are replicated to the external agent, but this is our main uh, control plane where we do all the chaos injection. So, now that we have uh, this running, what I'll do is I'll just do a watch kubectl get pods of the uh, demo namespace since we can keep a watch on the nginx since we are going to terminate this uh, nginx container, this pod. Now, I am also going to do a watch here on the kubectl get pods uh, because uh, I would. Um, induced chaos, which will trigger all these different CRs that I just talked about, the uh, chaos uh, the chaos engine and the, the chaos runners and the chaos jobs. So you'll be able to see all of them pop up here. And this, this guy will keep terminating uh, till whatever I put the chaos uh, duration and those things. So um, moving forward, uh, since that is clear, that is out of the way, we can, what we can do is uh, we can just go to workflows 
just minimize this a bit you can go to workflow so you can click on schedule a workflow and here you can see we have uh, two things we have a self agent and a mini cube so we can decide which agent we want this uh, chaos to be on since i want it on aks i will select uh, self agent and go next and here you have four options so what are these uh, you can either schedule uh, create a uh, chaos with uh, any of the templates that we provide so currently we have two stock shop and potato head and um, if not that you can also select a existing template so what are templates basically let's say you have a custom uh, custom workflow which is uh, particular to your needs and you do not want to do this again and again so you can save it as a template and use it that will save your time another is uh, this is from my hub this is the same hub that i connected so you can see private hub here if i want to run my own enterprise experiment i can do so with the custom hub and also there's an option to import your workflows so i won't be importing anything i'll just choose the my hub section the chaos hub because i want to run a simple pod delete and not do anything else for the workflow name i'll just uh, I'll just do CNCF, uh, CNC meetup, let's say, and that should be fine. So I want to run the CNC meetup as a workflow so that you can differentiate that. And uh, if I do next, I should be able to see one basic install chaos experiment. I'll just, I'll just explain what this is really quick. And I just want to do a generic pod delete. So when I add this, I can see that um, this uh, experiment has been added and it's in the default namespace and the application label that is targeting is app nginx now um, if i go to the yaml i can see a few things here so let me just explain this yaml real quick uh, the essential part so we have uh, these things right so there's this something called a steps and in the steps it what it does is actually installs the chaos experiment this is the same as uh, if you go to this diagram this chaos experiment is already being pulled by the by the goal uh, code that is there and chaos engine is actually the one responsible for the image pulls and all this so if you go back come back here it will install this particular chaos experiment that we pull which is spot delete in this case and uh, the name of the um, experiment is spot delete which also has a chaos engine attached to it and uh, if we if we come down here this is the chaos experiment cr so you can see that if the exact cr that is there in uh, litmus hub as well the chaos hub as well if you come down we should be able to see the pod delete and it it should have a chaos engine so you can see the kind is chaos engine and you can see the app namespace that is targeting is default and app label is nginx and those things it's a kind deployment and uh, these are the tunable so you can change the total chaos duration to let's say 60 seconds the chaos interval and if you want to force it or not and those things so i am pretty happy with it i'm just going to close it I am not going to do anything. What I want to do is, since my application is running on this demo namespace, I would quickly go to this uh, wizard and change my app namespace to demo. So if I do that now, it doesn't complain and it says you have your uh, deployment nginx running there with the app level of app, app nginx, so it's fine. If I go next, I have the option to add probes, which is uh, well, probes is another uh, way of adding certain health checks to your application if you want to, and uh, if you do not uh, like. Put any probes for it it'll just return zero or 100 based on whether your uh, chaos passed or failed but if you want to specifically target let's say an http uh probe or let's say uh, uh, something related to cmd then you can do so with the help of probes so i'm going to finish the same and now you can see the namespace change to demo and the application is uh, app nginx and there's something called as revert schedule so what it will do is if it's true it will uh, delete all the chaos resources that have been created for injecting chaos so that way you don't have to manually keep track and delete all these things once chaos is done also if if you do not want to use prometheus and grafana and you want to keep those chaos resources there's something called as job uh, cleanup policy if you if i if you see this there's something called as job cleanup policy uh, which is set to retain what we'll do is uh, uh, it will retain the particular chaos resource that was created for this experiment so you can use it for your own analytic solution if you do not like grafana or prometheus or you have your own uh, uh, solution for your system, for your enterprise requirement so I'm just going to keep the reward schedule to true since I do not want them to stick around in this cluster. And uh, once that's done, I'll just click on next. And this is a wait section, which is uh, which you can of course go ahead and explore if you want to learn more. But this is uh, sort of a priority which it attached it attaches some sort of a priority to your application. So if if you select it to low, uh, the resilience score will matter. But I'm just going to keep it to high. Now moving forward, I wanted to schedule. Now you can create a cron job as well if you want to by doing a recurring schedule so this is the um summary of what i have done so i am the cluster name is self agent i have this is my workflow name i'm i haven't given a description this is just a boilerplate and uh, 
I wanted to schedule now and it has this one uh, experiment. So if I go ahead and finish it, I'll just uh, put it to the side for now so that I can show this injection happening. So when I finish it, you will see a lot of things popping up here. One will be the CNC meetup. Uh, that is the main workflow that pops up, which will pop this chaos runner, uh, this chaos job, uh, this uh, chaos runner, which will pop multiple chaos jobs. So that is what's going to happen. And then you can see Nginx uh, terminating. So if I go and do this, so it has been created. If I go to workflows, you can see things popping up now. CNC meetup has started popping up. Now, if I click on this, I would be able to see a visualization of the live uh, thing happening. So I hope this is visible and you can, let me just minimize it a bit. You can see the main workflow is uh, going on right now. It's uh, the pod initializing. Once it is finished, it'll do the install chaos experiment, which is the step I just showed you on the YAML. Uh, once it installs the experiment, which is pod delete, you can see this, the chaos engine would actually, the chaos engine would trigger it to the particular uh, uh, target cluster that you have. So in this case, the target is demo Nginx, uh, Nginx in the demo namespace. So once this step is finished, we can see this Nginx uh, pod terminating and this will happen till the time runs out. So we have our main, uh, this, will, this will keep going on since it is the main workflow. It will spawn multiple chaos jobs, which we will see in a minute. So also if, it, if you click on any of this particular pods, you can, the steps basically, you can see the logs for the same, since it's a install experiment, it won't have any logs. But uh, yeah, so this one finished. If you click on pod delete, it should have log logs since we are using subscriber connections. So the subscriber should return logs for the same. And uh, so you can see these multiple uh, chaos jobs have been created. Currently, uh, the pod delete is running and you can see logs for them the same. You can, you can also do a kubectl log here as well, but this is the same output that you get here. So um, now we can see a pod delete has been initiated and it's container creating phase. Once it's running, this should terminate. And you would see the thing happening here, right here. So it would probably take some time to create the same. And, all right, so you can see Nginx is terminating and it is again coming back up. So this is, this is our hypothesis that if you're targeting a particular application and you're seeing it is, terminated and coming back up, then that means your application is resilient. Also, we have this another CR called chaos results, which I just talked about as one of the three main CRs. So chaos result will actually tell you how much your resilience score is. So if uh, it is, uh, you know, below 50, then your application isn't resilient. And it will also tell you uh, like where exactly what failed and what is your probe success percent and uh, where do you stand in this total zero to hundred percent resilience score. So that way you can figure out what, uh, what you need to change. Why is it running? So why, why it failed? You can check, check out the logs and figure it out. So now that pod delete has been completed. Once this uh, entire thing uh, completes, you can also see the runner right here. So once this entire uh, thing completes, we should be able to see the chaos results pop up right here. So currently it's not since it's still ongoing. Once it finishes, everything will be a green check mark and that will give you uh, a visual idea about that this has finished and you can just go ahead and check the results. So I think once it finishes in, in your local cluster, it takes up a minute or two to uh, like actually display the same in the UI. But yeah, that's that's mostly, that's the demo. And uh, so I think it is completed and it should just pop up in a minute. Yeah. All right. So it is doing the reward schedule now since I had it to true. So uh, all this chaos resources that was created, you can see that it just got deleted and it's clean now and uh, there's nothing retained in, in your cluster. Everything just uh, went away. And your Nginx is also running with 81 seconds as the age. So it's a new one that uh, just got created and everything is green. So that means you have pretty, you have successfully, like uh, your resilience is hundred percent. You have successfully completed the workflow. And if I go to chaos results, now I have the result and I can see at the very bottom, the probe success percent is hundred and my phase is complete and the experiment status verdict is passed. So if I come back to my workflow, I should see the overall resilience is 100% and I had one out of one experiment which passed. So you can uh, club your workflow workflows with multiple experiments. You can do pod CPU hub or pod network loss, whatever is your requirement. And you can club them together to form one single workflow and check the resilience for the same. So yeah, that's uh, mostly it for my presentation. And uh, 
I hope you guys enjoyed it. If there are any questions, I'd love to take them now. Thank you very much, Sayan. It was a very interesting presentation and use case. Um, so I saw before there were some uh, hands raised. Uh, if anyone would like to speak up or um, put a question uh, to Saya, just feel free to do it now. Or not. <laughs> so I don't see anything, no questions. Beautiful. So thank you very much, Sayan, again. And I would Thanks say, yes. Do you have anything else to share? Maybe any um, link or something, then feel free to, to do it on the, on the chat channel. Sure. Great. Stefan, it's your time to excite Thanks. our people. <laughs> yeah, that's my time for entertainment. Exactly. <laughs> Let me entertain okay. So first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, Mark and Sian for great uh, uh, presentations and uh, their talks. And Sergio, thanks a lot for having us uh, here today. So let me share my screen and we will get started. Okay. Great, everything works. Uh, yeah, just a minute. Okay, Great. so um, Dapper, one year in production, uh, we will talk today about that. So we will talk about, uh, first of all, uh, about the modern distributed systems, uh, how they are, uh, basically I will talk about my involvement uh, as a software engineer and developer and alongside I've uh, found that I was evolving with the modern distributing systems how they were going from one to ten. Uh, then we will go through the overview of Dapper. Uh, I will show some demo about uh, how it's working and some uh, interesting stuff and then I will talk about the Dapper cases which we are uh, using right now and some interesting stuff and uh, uh, interesting cases which we encountered and uh, that was challenging. So first of all, who am I? I'm a technical program manager at Ventus Cloud AG. Uh, basically we are building uh, cloud. <laughs> uh, I'm solution architect. Uh, I am full cycle software engineer, meaning that I'm doing basically everything starting from developing code, testing, uh, infrastructure stuff, uh, uh, developing uh, like talking with customers like everything so that's like full cycle starting from zero to here uh, I'm also open source contributor uh, whether we are using some uh, open source tools and that's one of our motto to use mostly just open source tools we are trying to contribute there so I'm also a, a part of that uh, and also I'm a tech speaker. So from time to time, I'm uh, doing some talks about technical stuff, which we are doing uh, with our team and myself. Uh, here's the link to my GitHub. Uh, there might, might be some interesting uh, repositories and basically for most of the stuff, which if I'm doing like uh, personal, uh, personally, uh, some developing for demos, uh, I'm, use, I'm using my repo, so you can find it there. I'm also a certified uh, Kubernetes administrator and uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, application developer and some other certifications which I've uh, earned during my career. So let's start with modern distributed systems. Uh, basically right now, most of the uh, like in different uh, aspects of uh, engineering, software engineering right now, uh, using distributed systems at four categories. First, it's uh, life cycle, then networking, bindings, and state. So let's go from one by one. So at first also, uh, when I started to my path as a developer and engineer, uh, I've uh, got my hands on uh, Kubernetes. Basically, we started to use Kubernetes at the work where I worked at that point. 
And uh, this is the part of life cycle of your application. So basically Kubernetes provides you with a lot of different tools, which basically handles all of the life cycle, which you want. And it provides you with extensions if you don't, uh, if you need something beyond Kubernetes. So basically ones are deployments, placements, uh, configuration management, very good at uh, isolation failures and resource. And also it can run different workloads like stateless and stateful. And if it's not enough for you, you can extend it with sidecars. We will talk a lot about sidecars uh, during this talk. Controllers, operators, basically operators that the custom controllers of Kubernetes. And everything inside Kubernetes is controlled by controllers. So operator is a custom controller, which you write yourself. And also with Helm charts, it's also the part of extension or similar uh, tools like Helm. Uh, they provide you with a lot of extensions if you are not enough with that. So next, when we started to use Kubernetes, we found that uh, Kubernetes provides the basic level of networking, which you can configure and you can use like load balancer, services, uh, etc. But at some point you think that you need something advanced, like uh, you need the API gateway, um, something like that. So when we, uh, so next part is networking with lifecycle. So on top of uh, Kubernetes, you can use, uh, we identify these tools that are most proficient for like our cause. It's uh, Istio, it's provided you with observability, security and release strategies. It's very great at uh, traffic management. Basically one of the networking, which you want to use advanced networking, it's traffic management inside your cluster. And you can use Scopper for geo-distributed systems when, for example, you have two locations at different geographic, geographically different locations, and then you need to bind them and your application should work as it is in local network. Scopper is good at that. So that's networking part. Next, when you work with some uh, workloads, different one and different patterns, you might find that you need binding. Uh, at uh, that moment of time, uh, we saw that there was this uh, project, Knative. Right now it's already GA production ready, but at the moment when we encountered it, it was like at the early phases of development. And it, we found that it is uh, good at uh, working with bindings when you need to bind some components between themselves. And when you have even driven uh, uh, pattern where everything is communicated bet uh, between themselves, like microservices communicates using events. Knative is really great also at that. Uh, the downside of that, for, but that's like my uh, personal feeling. For me, it was hard to develop uh, applications using Knative, using their event systems. Because for example, when I need custom events, it was a bit uh, not user friendly, I would say. Uh, next one is state. As a developer, you might find that you need to work with some uh, basically local states and to also talk between uh, uh, different services uh, using messaging. So here's come Dapper. Dapper. We started to use it at the version of uh, 0.6. Right now it's 1.2. So 0 0.6 was really uh, already uh, great uh, as we thought. There were some items issues that were not working great, but we had faith in it and put our faith in it and uh, it was repaid uh, to us. So Dapper provides a great uh, capabilities for messaging and state. But beyond that, Dapper is also providing bindings. It also providing networking and uh, it is from for me, for example, I, as uh, I am like daily user of Kubernetes and I'm really like the Kubernetes system of declaratives of the, how everything is working in there. And I see Dapper as a extension of Kubernetes. So they've developed everything at the, at the level where you are really comfortable. If you are comfortable with Kubernetes, you will be comfortable with uh, Dapper. That's the downside of working with Knative about which I talked that, for example, for Knative, I was not that comfortable with working with that. So uh, 
Dapper is a distributed application runtime. Basically, it provides you with all of different kind of tools which uh, help you to uh, write your distributed applications. Basically, your solutions. When you have different microservices which communicate between each other, and you need to provide all of this stuff which I talked uh, on the previous slide, Dapper provides uh, all of that in one piece. Some of the things it, it doesn't provide. So for example, uh, some, uh, some tell that Dapper is a service mesh like Istio, but that's not the sole purpose of Dapper. So it, yes, it, at, the, at the core level of Dapper, the service mesh pattern is used, but they, it is not a service mesh because service mesh is running uh, uh, silently and your application doesn't know that there is some service mesh running inside your Kubernetes cluster. Dapper, on the other hand, you need to communicate with it. Your application knows that there is Dapper and you need to utilize it uh, to make sure that you're like doing everything uh, with it. So that's the uh, thing. So Dapper have uh, this block, basically it is sit between any cloud infra uh, infrastructure as I said, it's like the Kubernetes, you can run it in any cloud infrastructure. So it sits uh, uh, on Kubernetes and between Kubernetes and your application code. And it's, it supports any application code, again, the same as Kubernetes. So there, it does not, doesn't matter at which language you write. They also provide great um, uh, as the case in different languages. For example, my language of choice is Golang and I'm trying to write everything in Golang. So, and Dapper also written in Golang. That's why it's for, for me, for example, easy to uh, contribute to them when I see that I can help with something or uh, be of use for them. So let's go through building blocks as uh, Dapper folks say that's the, at the, in, in Dapper, these are like building blocks which you can use to build your distributed application. So that service to service invocation, basically when you can uh, invoke something using HTTP or gRPC on the other microservices. And you do an invocation like it's uh, running locally because for each application which is running inside Dapper, you have small Dapper uh, sidecar, which is running alongside with it. Uh, then you have state management uh, where you can connect to some external states or internal ones and use it as a shared state or local state just for your micro microservice. Uh, you have pop sub pattern. You can use like Redis messaging or any other. There's a lot of different message brokers are supported. Uh, resource bindings, like when you need to connect to some external event system. You can implement uh, actors. You have already built-in observability. You can work with different secrets, Kubernetes or outside, for example, Vault. And you have like really great platform for ex ex extensibility, where you can extend Dapper in the same way how you extend the Kubernetes. You can contribute and provide different kind of extensions using middlewares and other components. So for me, uh, like right now, the one of the latest uh, things which uh, was introduced to microservices, it's service mesh and everything is based on the service mesh level like Istio or, or some other stuff. They're really popular for the last years. Dapper for me is a so-called mesh architecture where basically if you imagine like uh, the Iron Man, the Iron Man, Tony Stark, is just a man, a human, but he suits up with his uh, armor and he have all of different capabilities. In the same way, I see Dapper. Basically, you have your microservices, which, which does the business logic, which you want to do. And then you suit it up with Dapper sidecar, which provide you with all of different kinds of capabilities. And the, it also provides service, uh, the uh, pros of service mesh, like for example, all of the communication inside Dapper network is secured with MPLS. Uh, you have uh, also after uh, 
the Dapper API are, can be protected or unprotected. That's for your choice of how you uh, implement that. And it's like one of the, for me, it's really comfortable to work with as a developer. Because for example, uh, we had uh, one of the cases which we had uh, using Dapper is we uh, use it to uh, publish uh, and subscribe pattern for uh, messaging. And then at some point we, we used Redis as a, like our first choice for that. At some point we thought that, okay, Redis is not working. Something was uh, not quite good with that version of Redis, which we used. So I said, okay, let's try to use some other. I've installed Nuts streaming and just does uh, done um, basic re reconfiguration of the component. I will show you a bit later in, during the demo how, how it's done. Uh, and then just restarted my pods uh, in Kubernetes and done. Uh, it worked fine. Inside application, I didn't need to change even one symbol of a code because Dapper provides one universal um, interface and you talk with Dapper. And it's already like the work of a Dapper of how he communicates with uh, different backend system, which supports pops up, state management, et cetera. So we've done, basically we've uh, changed our uh, messaging broker like for five, during five minutes, it took me like five minutes to install nuts and reconfigure Dapper, restart port, and everything was working correctly without no issues. So that's one of the uh, great encounters which we found in Dapper. You can, you don't need to change code when you develop for Dapper and with it. So let's do a little bit of demo and I will show you. So I have a cluster, Kubernetes, uh, let me, okay. So I already have installed uh, everything I need in here. So I have uh, Dapper, it's installed like the operator inside the Kubernetes cluster. It's installed in the Dapper system namespace. There are different uh, ways of how you can do it. That's like I've used it to Helm chart one command and it's uh, in. Then uh, I have uh, installed Redis for state store and for messaging. I will be showing you this demo with using state store. And then we have distributed calculator. That's one of the, uh, uh, one of the quick starts from Dapper. Uh, let me open up the here, distributed calculator. So just for you to see uh, the uh, architecture of that. Basically we have five different uh, small microservices, front end, which is written on in React. There is a uh, uh, adder, which adds two numbers written in GoLand, then subtract, subtractor with, written in C sharp, multiplier written in Python and divider written in Node.js. And all of these are running inside pods alongside each uh, container with our application. We have a container uh, Dapper, which is uh, running as proxy. All of the communications which are going to the uh, Dapper network goes through the containers. So basically when I'm doing some command on React frontend, like adding two numbers, it goes to Dapper and say, hey, I know that you have the uh, service, or the adder. Uh, I want to have the service invocation of uh, that service and add two numbers. Then this Dapper uh, sidecar goes to the Dapper sidecar of uh, adder and Dapper sidecar of ad adder uh, sends request to the service and it goes the, the same way it goes back. So all of the communication from, from the perspective of your service, uh, of your microservice is running uh, on local host. If we go into some code uh, of the React, and here's the server, which is in Express. 
And if you can see that we have the Dapper URL, which is basically localhost and port. Default port is uh, uh, 3,500. 3, and then you, we are going to use the Dapper API uh, invoke. And all of the invocations of other services like adding, subtracting, multiply, divide are going through the Dapper URL. Basically we're saying, okay, Dapper URL that's uh, API version one will invoke, then name of the server method and name of the method, and that's it. And all of the communication will go through Dapper and on a secure channel, by default, uh, Dapper is uh, securing all of the communications using MTLS in the same way as other service meshes uh, does that. So uh, from the perspective of your application, everything is running localhost. You don't need to some external uh, uh, endpoints or something like that. Same goes with the store. When I need to connect to some to store to put some files or to get some uh, put some data or get some data, I'm just uh, using a state uh, API of Dapper and providing state name, state store in here. Uh, let's see how it works. So this is the uh, basic front end. So uh, for example, seven uh, plus eight, 10. What happened here is that these numbers are collected and then based on the button which I hit, the uh, uh, React form goes to appropriate endpoint and goes to other service uh, yeah. some other service to basically it's calling other service to do it and this sorry yeah it is. and this data is like the actual uh, number is stored not in the React form, it is stored in the state store, which is right now backed up by Redis. So you can use a state or all of different uh, components uh, like uh, and by using Redis for that. So uh, this is how Dapper works. This is like the basic uh, uh, basic demo of that. And um, in here, like, yeah, let me show you. So they have this for the quick starts, all of different kinds of uh, um, examples, which you can uh, see and use. They're really easy to understand. I usually, when I've done a couple uh, already tech talks about, about Dapper and uh, during my first tech talks, I didn't even use some kind of formal presentation because their documentation is so good and great and these quick examples that you don't need nothing else. You don't need to create something else. You're just saying, okay, let's go, here it is. And it's providing full instruction of how that can be used. So uh, that's the demo of that. Uh, we saw that Dapper basically have uh, a couple of things, uh, uh, a couple pods which are running in, in there. There is operator basically, which is uh, responsible for all of different stuff. There is placement server, which is resp responsible for placing all of the pods. There is sidecar, sidecar injector. When you create, uh, uh, initialize, I would say, the de deployment with uh, Dapper, it uh, goes through the uh, operator. It, so it sees that you have uh, the annotations provided that you need that you want to use Dapper, and then Sidecar Injector basically is the service who actually injects Dapper inside your deployment. You have Sentry for security and also Dapper dashboard. Dashboard is basically like the Kubernetes dashboard when you can go and see all of different kind of stuff inside Dapper. To be honest, I didn't 
looked at it <laughs> yet. Uh, I'm like using the console mostly for work with that. Uh, so how is to initialize? Let's use the same distributed calculator for not go, but deploy. For example, we have this go adder. To initialize Dapper inside uh, for your application, you just need to provide these annotations. They're really easy. The default one, which you need to provide uh, all the time that are two that's enabled, you're saying true, basically with that you need to enable the Dapper for this uh, deployment. And you need to provide application ID, which will be used as unique identifier inside your Dapper network. Also, this application ID is the one which you are using for uh, invoking. Basically, that's the name of your service, which will be registered in the upper network. If you want some uh, other services to call your service, you need to provide application port on which it, it should be called. If you don't want that, for example, we have services which are uh, non-reachable uh, from for other service, we just don't provide app port, which means that uh, Dapper cannot interact with it, with this application. And there are a bunch of other annotations which you might want to use like configurations or some other stuff in their pipelines, et cetera. You can, they provide really great flexibility. Uh, and the, um, the thing about Dapper, the ideology of it is that, at least from my understanding and how I see it, is that all of the heavy lifting for the infrastructure for your application is done by Dapper. They even say that, okay, uh, you should provide big resources for Dapper sidecar for your pod uh, because it might grow really fat, uh, really fat with a lot of resources like CPU and RAM because all of the network connectivity, all of the, like the example, the network connections is done by Dapper sidecar, not by your application. Your application is just talking with Dapper if you're developing that. Like in localhost, it is working inside the restricted network of your pod. All of this uh, uh, network stuff is not going outside of the pod. And all of the outside networking outside the port is done by Docker. That's why uh, they say that even for production, you need to, you might expect that the Docker might have like three, four CPUs or like four gigabytes of RAM, and that might be fine for sidecar. That's the difference from the uh, service meshes like Istio or other, because they try to make the sidecar as less as possible with the as less resources usage as possible. Dapper doesn't go that way. Dapper say that, okay, your application should use enough resources for that, but all of the heavy lifting will be done by Dapper inside Kubernetes cluster and network. So that's why you need to provide resources for that. Um, yeah, so that's for demo. They have really great quick starts in here, like starting from uh, Hello World, Hello Kubernetes, basic ones, and some uh, advanced, I would say, like middleware. Uh, in Ventus Cloud, we are using, uh, if we go through the blocks, we are using service to service invocation, state management, pops up, uh, observability, and different middlewares. Uh, which are helping us to protect API, uh, uh, to protect our services, our API layer, and also to support that. One of the things which we are using, so let's go to the next topic, is uh, cases of how we use in Dapper, Dapper and what are the cases. I've tried to, uh, like, give me a second. Uh, sorry. So I found myself that uh, I've tried to, this uh, diagram to make as easy as possible and found that it's really hard to do because this you see at the diagram is the authentication uh, authorization code, uh, uh, grant code uh, of the OAuth 2.0 protocol. 
Uh, we are uh, in the Dapper, there is middleware which provides that protocol and basically provides the authentication of it. So how it works. First, from the browser, and that's one of the thing, it is working only with the browser because the of the nature of authorization code flow. Uh, so you, like browser, front end sends request to the API and API is protected by Dapper. Dapper uh, sees that there is no session with the API and Dapper itself. So he said, okay, I'm redirecting you to authorization and you have uh, configured the authorization server. Browser then goes to authorization and authenticate, providing login, password, and maybe some other things like uh, using the standard flow of the OAuth protocol. After authorization is complete, uh, OAuth server redirects you to back to Dapper because on this, when uh, Dapper redirects you to uh, to our URL. It provides you redirect URL back to itself, back to Dapper. So when author authorization is complete, authentication and authorization is complete, the redirection will go not to the API but to the Dapper. So you return back to Dapper with the code, then this number five. Dapper receives this code and go. Uh, and it goes by himself to authorization server and say, okay, I have the code from user, give me the token. Authorization server returns back token. And this token, here's the, uh, which, here's why we are using Dapper in here, basically. This token is never returned back to the client. Client never sees it. Browser never sees this token. So that's a part of security. Basically you cannot, steal a token if you don't see it, never. Dapper basically stores this token inside his memory. And when he receives this token, he creates a session, like a, a session for your connection and send you this session ID saying, okay, right now you can go redirect to the API, to the original link, which you were going through with a session ID. Here's the session ID you need to use. Then your browser goes to the API with session ID, Dapper, looks up inside the memory, and for the session ID, it have stored token. It takes this token, adds it to, the, to your request, basically like a proxy, and then lets you go to the API. So this token, which you received from our server, is only going through the APIs between Dapper and API, and maybe some other service, it doesn't matter. So on the client side, you never will see this token. Yes, you will see the session ID, and in the usual in the usual flow, you will receive this token yourself in browser, and then using this token, you will go to API, and uh, this token contains information about you, about authorization, etc. So right now you your browser doesn't have it. Your browser have only session ID. It is protected in the same way how usually token would be protected, but you actually doesn't have a token. And that's one of these more security steps which uh, Dapper provides. Basically it protects the data of user. It protects API from being stolen and being parsed, for example. So, let me show you how this works. It's actually implemented inside our portal. So I will go to our portal. Uh, you saw that it was an initializing at the moment. Basically, when you firstly go to our portal, to our UI, it, init, it goes through initialization phase, init phase. Then uh, during that init phase, we are making a call to the API. And, that, and there is this wall of Dapper. He sees that you don't have any session ID and it redirects you to the, our authentication server. Now I need to provide my uh, credentials. After that, we go back to Dapper. Dapper provides all of the, uh, gets all of the stuff from it and we are in. So basically all of these, connections, all of these requests, 
you might see that they, they are uh, long to take, but actually they are really fast. And there are some pitfalls and things uh, which uh, we hit when we started using it. For example, with the API, when you work with a uh, browser and browser goes to API, it goes using HTTPS. The thing is that Dapper was not supporting HTTPS. It, was, it is working only with HTTP. And this final redirect, number seven, when you actually need to go to API one more time, it was redirecting with the HTTP. So that was my first contribution to Dapper. We uh, provided, if we go to the, yeah. so if we go to documentation, middle of our, and there is, uh, of two middle bar. Uh, I suggested to add this flag first HTTPS. Basically, when you have interactions with uh, between browser and API, and you need this final redirect to be HTTPS, you just set this value to true, and it will be HTTPS. Because by default, using HTTP protocol and all of the redirects it will always redirect you with HTTP. It will not redirect you with HTTPS. Even if the first, this call number one was HTTPS, because of the nature of Dapper, uh, you will not receive HTTPS. So that was why my first contribution to add that uh, inside the uh, component middle R, which we are, were using. Um, Second case, which we are also uh, hit and found it really easy, it's sending emails. We have a couple of different services which were sending emails, emails to our clients. And we found that uh, we written one service, which is uh, sending email, just to make it uh, like one code base, one service which is responsible just for sending email. And then we thought, okay, what is the best model to use? Or what is the best pattern to use? And uh, we use it pops up where actually at the left, we have different services. If they need to send the mail, they compose event and put it in the, the message queue. And we have email service, which is reading from that message queue. That's the pops up pattern, which is also provided by uh, Dapper. Uh, so uh, that was really great for us to use. Basically, you have always one interface where you just put in your event what you want to send, and you have uh, the on the second part receiver, basically publishers and subscribers. And third case which I want to cover today is uh, storing data. So this is the uh, image from uh, Dapper documentation where they, they describe how the data is stored. Basically, we have service A, which is uh, which have sidecar. Through that sidecar, you are connecting to the uh, stage store. Uh, in here, it is as example as Redis, uh, uh, but you can use any other stores. There are like multiple different uh, choices for you. And Dapper provides simple API when you want to store something or you want to get something. And all you need to do as a, uh, we also uh, hit here with the things where we were choosing the tool and switching between different tools like tools like Redis for uh, supporting the state store was really easy. We just need to reconfigure this component and Component configuration is really easy. Uh, let me show you. So basically here is the component for state store. Uh, we're, you're just saying which type it is and provides connection string. Redis connections are really easy and uh, even they are just providing that you can use Kubernetes secret to use password, uh, to get password for connection. And uh, that's it. We just, you, when you want to switch from one to another, you just need to reconfigure this component and that's all. You don't need to, to do anything inside your application. So 
we found up are really great for different kinds of migrations because you don't need to change your code for that when you hit it. So this is like the basic uh, uh, thing. Uh, the our thing which we like using right now is that we have a client like front end which is calling one service to get data. Uh, to get this data, uh, service A goes to service B. Uh, service B uh, is actually doing two things. First, by schedule, it goes to external system, gathers all of the different kinds of data doing some calculations and changes and then store it inside state store. And basically we have all of this original data inside external system, but we want to provide it fast. So we are using state store as a, like fast access for the uh, system. Uh, so, uh, so when when client wants to have some data, it goes to service A, service A goes to service B and say, hey, give me data from your store. Uh, so this was like the original approach and they already created a support for so-called shared store, basically where you have one store and all kinds of different uh, microservices can read from it and can write, basically have access there. Uh, this was not the original approach because the original approach of uh, states was that only the service which is uh, writing to, to the store should have read access to the same data which is right. So it's like only for one service. And if you need to, from the other service to access data for some other, like from service A to access data from service B, you need to call service B and if service B supports providing you with that data, it will give you that. So uh, these are the cases how we are using Dapper. We are like me personally, I'm really uh, comfortable with using it. It's providing all of different kinds of capabilities, all of different uh, uh, things like these building blocks is really great. They cover all of different things which is necessary for your distributed application. Some things they are not provided, but they, there are tools which might help you with that also. And uh, they are compatible. I also saw some uh, uh, articles regarding that you can run Dapper with Istio because for example, Dapper doesn't provide API gateway and traffic management, but Istio does that but it's really complicated to run both. So when you choosing your tools, you need to like make a choice what you need best and for what purposes. We found ourselves that uh, for different solutions, we're using different tools. Dapper is like one of the major and obvious choice for us because it provides all of different things in one place. You just install it and use it and that's it. It's easy to develop with it and for it. Um, yeah, so uh, I have here a link with uh, credits for documentation of Dapper. Once again, documentation is really great. Like almost everything you want to know about Dapper, you will find there. And more like deep cases, yes, you go. You need to go to GitHub and look through the code sometimes. Uh, there are also two articles uh, which uh, is really great uh, describing the. Uh, uh, distributed uh, design modern ones, the microservice architecture with modern distributed uh, systems and uh, stuff like that. So, thank you. Great, Stefan, just in time. <laughs> thank you very much for uh, this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, we have one question for Stefan from Ashvin. I hope I, I said the name correctly and so he is asking for using dapper on if not already answered for using dapper on the edge iot devices what is the memory footprint required since these are typically constrained environments uh so it depends on the load on your edge iot device so basically dapper 
does the, as I said, the heavy lifting for you. So all of the network connectivity will go through Dapper. Uh, you can uh, use in different annotations. Uh, if you know, for example, that you have the like limited resources for it, you can provide these limitations saying that, okay, Dapper sidecar should have no more than uh, half of uh, CPU and for example, uh, uh, half of gigabyte of RAM, and Dapper will respect that. Uh, will it be effective? Uh, depends on the load. Dapper is written to be really fast, to like work and process a lot of messages, a lot of data really fast. That's, by the way, one of the reasons I think they choose Golang to write Dapper. Uh, so it depends on the load and you need to do testing regarding how much resources you need to provide. From my experience, yes, it's, it's uh, uh, at the lower layer, like you just use your application and then you install Dapper all inside with it. It will get something like 70 or 80 megabytes of RAM just in idle mode. So it's already using that. And then it depends on the uh, how much network and processing you want Dapper to take, you want Dapper to use. The production re recommendation uh, from the Dapper themselves is that uh, you need to limit uh, Dapper sidecar for four CPU and four gigabytes of RAM. That's like the maximum which it can use. Uh, if you have lesser requirements, I would suggest you to just uh, try it out and see uh, how it works with the workload, with the network load, which you have. Great, thank you very much. Ashwin, is, I hope uh, your question is answered. If you have anything else, just let me know or raise your hand. Um, is anyone else having any kind of question? Uh, topic related, of course. Yes. Ashwin is thanking you. <laughs> so thank you very much, Ashwin, for your question. And well, if nothing else here, then I would take over again. I see no raised hand, no message on the chat. Okay, there we go. So let me share my screen again. So we are coming to an end. Just as a kind reminder, our next edition will be on Thursday, October 21st, at the same time as this one at 4 p.m. Central European time. And there is, as I said, still one slot available. So if you have anyone, um, oh, there are Alexander, is raising a hand, so let me stop here. <laughs> and let me take, let me give Alexander the right to speak. Alexander, where do we have it? Here. Alexander, you are ready to talk. We don't hear you. Okay, this was a mistake, I guess. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Anyway, <laughs> it was an accident by, by Alexander. So I will continue with my super interesting talk then. Welcome to my TED talk. <laughs> so uh, yes, so if you would like to present uh, the next uh, present in the next uh, CNC meetup Switzerland, so just let me know. Um, follow us, of course, of vision.tv. You can subscribe and have everything. What, uh, of course, this uh, this this um, meetup will be. Um, uploaded soon. We are on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, and so on and so forth. So choose your favorite one and just give us a like. Thank you very much. 
at this point. At this point, I would like to thank everyone else too. Uh, I will go uh, this way, starting from Stepan, then uh, Sayan and Mark. Thank you very much. I hope every one of you enjoyed this uh, super interesting talk, uh, hoping that the next one will be as least as important as this one. My name again is Sergio Nuzzo. I'm the Business Development Manager of Vision, your host on this meetup. If you want to get in contact with me, there is my uh, direct email address or, of course, a phone number said so. Thank you again. Enjoy this beautiful rainy evening and hope to talk and see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, bye. Hi, have a nice evening. Bye.